Hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss a book that I absolutely adored. This is The Woman of Troy by Pat Barker. Now I have to admit this is the first book I've read about I've read by Pat Barker. I'm aware this book is also a supposed sequel to her bestseller The Silence of the Girls, but I haven't read that either. I read this as a standalone book and I can tell you it works perfectly as a standalone book. You do not need to have read um, the works before, um, but of course, like most of this very popular reimagining of Greek myths, feminist retellings of famous Greek myths and stories uh, that are part of our culture, it does help if you know a little bit about the source material. So in this book, The Women of Troy, we are set after the Trojan War. The horse has already been deployed into Troy, the massacre of Troy has happened, the Greeks have defeated their enemy after a long bitter war using a, a bit of trickery and an extraordinary unleash of slaughter. However, they have lost their hero Achilles and they are stuck on the uh, beach at Troy because even though they have won and the, Gr the Greeks have slaughtered their enemy, they cannot travel home. They need a change of wind and they need a change of fortune in order to be able to go home after years and years and years under the siege and then subsequent war of Troy. But of course, in Pat's book, this is about changing your perspective and seeing it from the perspective of the women. These are the former women, the former queens and the upper classes of Troy. These women have been, their men have been slaughtered and they have been enslaved as sex slaves or as prisoners or as workhorses for the Greek men, for the Greek army. Some of them we know, such as Helen of Troy, we know her because she is the very glamorous queen of uh, Greece that was the excuse for the Greeks to come back and and take uh, Troy when in fact, of course, it was a big power battle. But Helen is the queen of Greece and she has been reunited with her husband, which she doesn't really particularly want. You also have the former queen. So you have the former wife of Priam, who was the king of Troy, Hecuba. And you also have some of the other women from Troy, both in the middle classes and also some from the lower classes from Troy. What you don't have though, is the status. So these women's status have been completely transformed. It is a, irrelevant almost what they were in Troy. This is what is happening to them now as enslaved people in the camps of the Greek men. What this is, is a fantastic examination of the cost of war. And this is where for me, Pat Barker's novels really elevate themselves just that little bit above the many retellings of Greek myths and Greek stories that are out there. This is a really incisive photograph of the cost of war. And even though we are reading something historic from thousands of years ago, we are actually in many ways reading about the suffering, the cost that comes to women whenever there is war. I actually work in war zones as my day job. I know, strange thing. So it was really interesting to me how I was reading the plots that will come on to, but how in, deep in my heart I felt I was actually bearing witness to the sufferings and struggles of women in places such as Central Africa where I work and Afghanistan and Syria. And it just, it was such a brilliant capture of a, of a dynamic and an issue that has never gone away. The lot of women in war, how they will always be the first to suffer. So here we are. So this book is told from the perspective of Briasus. Briasus is a former, I want to say lover of Achilles, but I not entirely consensual. She was kidnapped in a previous battle and she had become, uh, Achilles had taken her for his own. Achilles though now is dead. So Briasus protector has now disappeared. And it's from her eyes that we see what is happening as the camp starts to fall apart and the Greek army falls back into its factions, into its feuding, into its internal battles for power and preeminence am amongst the men. And what we have is the ultimate plot is, is really one of two things. Firstly, the Greeks are desperate to go home. And so it's this challenge that the Agamemnon and his court have in how they court the favor of the gods 
after the slaughtering of Troy. So it's this balance for Agamemnon, the king of the Greeks, and his and his allies in what they can do to curry favour with the gods in order to get them to go home. Does there have to be a reckoning for the sins that they have committed? And it's this wonderful balance between infinite justice and the justice of men and the clash that comes with it and sort of, yeah, how can you ask for a favour from God when you've just slaughtered an entire city? So there's that. But there's also a very clear plot device where the king of Troy, Priam, has been left unburied and desecrated. He has not been buried, he's been left out for the birds. This is a violation of justice and of um, the conventions of war, where you are allowed to bury your enemies. The women of Troy, there are some of them in the camp who've been obviously taken on as slaves, who want to bury their king, who see it as something that they want to be able to do. And it's part of their covert operation that Briasus observes for them to pay homage to their king and to bury him without enraging the Greek men who hold the strings of their lives. So these are women who are trying to look to be able to hold on to their ability to go through life, to have their own autonomy, to make their own decisions in a world where they quite clearly have none. They have lost all power. They walk around on eggshells. Their lives hang by threads um, every minute of every day. It's just that wonderful sense that Pat captures of all these women trying to hold on to elements of power in their lives when they have none. Um, I really, take for example two examples. We have Helen at the top, this incredibly beautiful woman who has all the powerful men of Greek, of the Greek army in her, you know, in throes of adoration. How long can a woman rely on beauty as a source of power? How long can it be before Helen's charm and her good luck expires? How long does beauty last as a source of power? And then there's some very interesting um, observations in comparison with Hecuba, who was the wife of Priam. She is an older woman now. She has no beauty. She has n no womb, nothing that you know, can, the Greek men can find of interest in either to bear sons. Uh, she is just a burden and a, obviously a, something from the enemy. But she has wisdom and she has uh, intellectual prowess. So can she, as this old woman with no womb left to offer, no sons left to bear, can she find a power in being able to use her intellect? Or does that even count for absolutely nothing when you're at the, when you're at the mercy of the Greek army? So it's this wonderful setup where you are looking at power structures through two very different lenses. You've got the women who are trying to sort of tussle amongst themselves for power in the community that they've been able to develop as enslaved people versus their power dynamics when taken in the broader spectrum of where they're going to stand in the Greek army. And eventually when those winds turn, they're going to have to leave, leave Troy for good. I want to use a quote from Pat Barker because I feel like I'm not explaining this book particularly well. But this is really the, what Pat Barker was trying to get at, um, and this is why I love it. Talking about the Greeks, they just won a war. How could it be that this victory, the greatest in the history of the world, and it was, there's no denying it, had started to taste like defeat? And that really captures the tone of this book. This is not a celebratory book. This is a Greek army beginning to fall apart. Its factions are beginning to develop. There is infighting, literal and metaphorical. It's getting nasty. People are pointing fingers. Everyone's looking for someone to blame. And yet in this very tense setup, it's the women who are trying to, there are some women who are trying to complete the most daring act of all, and is to bury the Trojan king. It is um, a book that has real tension. It has great narrative drive. The overarching theme of, like I said, infinite justice and, and seeking forgiveness from God and currying favor with a God when you've just slaughtered uh, tens of thousands of, of men and women and children is just really fascinating, that tussle, the, the mental gymnastics that these warriors can do that they think that what they've done is, is somehow just. And it feels very close 
to an extremely powerful um, pacifist argument. But what this is, is perhaps not being that specific. This is really about someone saying, you think war works like you see in the movies, that there are men fighting and then they come home. That's not how war works. War is messy. It takes years. It is all about power. It's not even about land or a beautiful woman that has to be recaptured because she fled because she couldn't be bothered to stay with an old king. This is about power. This is about who gets to rule. And what decimation, what murder, what loss is caused just by men deciding, I want more power than that man standing over there. It's an extraordinary book about women caught in the middle and brings, as Pat has always tried to do, I know, bring voice to women whose actual voices have been lost throughout history, as history has always been written by the victor. And the victor, as we know, has always been men. Brilliant book. I flew through it. The Woman of Troy by Pat Barker.